We're going to be in 2 Thessalonians this morning, so if you'd like to begin finding your way to that passage, 2 Thessalonians. You know, as we study the Bible and learn a lot of interesting facts about our Lord's return, we also learn about the man of sin, or he's sometimes called that wicked one, or sometimes you'll hear him talked about as the Antichrist. And soon, we're going to be looking at chapter 2 and all the prophetic events that make up God's timetable. So that's important. But you know what I found? As we study these interesting facts, we can sometimes lose sight of the practical, encouraging words about Christian living. And in fact, as we look at chapter 1, what I want you to see that Paul does for us is he reminds us that as we, as we look at all the facts and things are going to be happening, and as interesting as those facts are going to be, those facts are only a blessing when they're connected to the character of God. And this morning, what I really want you to do is I want you to see God. I want you to see who he is. I want you to be able to be growing in that knowledge of him, because as you do that, then all these other facts that we're going to learn, they're going to make sense. And instead of being frightening or scary as we talk about the end times and with all the things that have happened over the last few months, it's interesting. Whenever we get knocked out of our usual routine, everyone starts talking about, is, is this the end? Is Jesus coming back today? Um, are all these prophetic things that are happening, so now we know Jesus is coming? And the answer, as we've talked about, is, well, yes. Is this the end? But no, not because of COVID-19 or not because of these other things. We're just waiting for the Savior. Now, the Thessalonians had questions about this as well. Waiting or patience is something with which most people struggle. If you don't, I'm thrilled for you. I question whether or not you don't ever struggle with patience, but just because you're a people like me. You know, we've become so accustomed to instant things that we don't do patience very well. I walk into a bank. It's kind of interesting with your COVID-19 masks. It's like it's really hard for robbers these days. I mean, they never know who's robbing the bank and who's not, right? But you walk into a bank, you see a teller who's working on something, and there are no customers around. I expect to be served right away. Well, after waiting two or three minutes, seems like an eternity, I get impatient. You know, one definition of impatience is restless. I lose my rest. That's an interesting definition for me as I think about it. How often as an individual I lose my rest. I'm anxious. You know, that's an interesting thought for us as Christians because Satan wants you to lose your rest today. He wants you to be upset. He wants you to be pushing forward. You know, the only thing worse than waiting is waiting in the middle of something that's unpleasant. Paul's going to talk about persecution in our text today. Paul's visit to Thessalonica occurred in about 49 AD. Now, our Lord's crucifixion, his resurrection, his return to heaven happened about 16 years earlier. Think about that. that you would have been alive when Christ was crucified, resurrected, and when this book was written. That, it's about your lifespan right there. Paul had witnessed to the Thessalonians in the atmosphere of difficulty. Paul had to leave because of severe persecution and tribulation. And that's where uh, Dr. Luke in the book of Acts kind of picks up the story. And just as a real quick review for us, Luke explains how Paul came to Thessalonica and how the church was founded. Remember how Paul went to Macedonia because there was this man that issued this call and said, come to Macedonia and help us. So Paul and Silas and Luke and Timothy all arrived in Philippi. He led Lydia to the Lord, led her household to the Lord, led the jailer to the Lord. They ended up with this group of Christians that were there, but while Paul was there, he was beaten, he was falsely imprisoned, 
and he was put in jail. God delivered them by an earthquake. The jail shakes and the doors all fly open. The chains fall off. That's kind of a, a cool story for how your church began. You know, we don't have anything quite that exciting for our church. That would be a pretty neat story of, well, our church began with an earthquake. Well, after encouraging the believers, Paul left Philippi. He headed for the important city of Thessalonica, and that was about 100 miles from Philippi. Now, Paul is forced to leave Thessalonica because of persecution, but he left all those Christians in the same situation that he was fleeing from. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for leaving us. You have to leave, we have to stay. Can you imagine how hard feelings, misunderstandings can come about? You guys stay, live for the Lord. I've got to be in the next town. And people misunderstood Paul. So Paul wrote the first letter to them. Very possibly, we don't know for certain, but very possibly another letter came that was not from Paul, but was forged, and it had information in that that, would, that told them that they were in the tribulation, that they had, and they start listing all these different things, and these people are very confused. Paul had sent the first letter. Possibly the person stayed long enough to kind of see what was happening. The church went back to uh, Paul, and then when that messenger came back to Paul, he told him what was going on. Now, because these were both port cities, it would not be that uncommon for there to be transportation going back and forth uh, from Thessalonica to Corinth, which is where Paul was when he wrote this. So this group of Christians were frightened. They were concerned. And Paul begins with their most pressing need. And that is, you know, when they were struggling, the most pressing need was not to give them the bullet points for um, the end times. They wanted to know, they needed to know that. That wasn't the most pressing thing, though, they needed to know. So we begin, he begins his letter by focusing on who God is. He focuses on um, praise, reminding them of how God had answered prayer for them and how their lives were changed, and then he prays for them. So that just kind of helps you outline chapter 1. You know, not only does prayer change situations, but praise changes situations. One of the ways Satan tries to defeat you as a believer is to get you to think that everything is bad. And praise will strengthen your faith. One of the greatest weapons for fighting Satan is praise. And I would just encourage you, if you don't remember anything about what I'm about to preach today, could I just encourage you to remember, no matter what you're going through, Focus on God and praise him. Think about what God is doing and has done for you. Now we're going to begin with verse 3 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet. It's appropriate. Because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest or a visible token or sign of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also, we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of his calling and fulfill all his good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him 
according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Our Father, I pray this morning that you would open our eyes. We need the Holy Spirit to teach us through your word. Help us to understand. I pray today that we would be encouraged and built up because we have focused on you today. For it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. You know, he begins and he praises them. He says in verse 3, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. I want to begin with just this thought, and that is having a mind that focuses on God. You know, Paul demonstrated the importance of praising God for what he was doing, for answering prayer. You say, well, what prayer had been answered? If you back up to chapter 3, verse 10, notice what he prayed for. He said, night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Paul knew they had gaps in their understanding of the scriptures. They had gaps in being able to trust God for what they were going through. They were struggling. They were new believers. And they were struggling with this. And so Paul prays that they would begin to grow in their faith. Now notice verse 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men. Now those were his two prayer requests that they would increase in their faith and that they would abound more in love. Now notice what he says in verse 3 here of chapter 2. This is just a few months later, and Paul says, I am so thankful for the answer to prayer because you are growing in your faith and your love is increasing for one another. You know, one of the things that people can tell that we are Christians is by the way we treat each other, our love for each other. People don't understand doctrine. We understand it's the foundation that allows us to have secure lives when we know the truth, the truth sets us free. But the world doesn't understand that. All they look at is, how do we treat each other? How do we love each other? How do we get along with each other, even when we might not agree on everything? But you know what? You're my brother. You're my sister in Christ. So even if we don't agree, we should still be loving toward each other, shouldn't we? That's not always the case. Many of you have experienced that where it's like, well, you don't go to my church, we don't like you. You don't agree with me on everything doctrinally, we don't like you. But the truth is, it is, they were learning this truth, and that is, God is all that he says he is. God loves us unconditionally. We can love each other unconditionally. So he says, your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you toward each other aboundeth. And then he says, so we rejoice, and we're telling everyone in these other churches of your, and then he mentions two things, their patience and their faith. Those were the things that he really draws attention to. And Paul hears how these areas in their life have changed, and he recognizes that it was God who was doing the work in them. It wasn't Paul that did the work. It wasn't even the people themselves that were doing the work. It was God working through those people. So let's think about what, as they focused on God, what was taking place in their lives. And we talk about patience and we talk about faith. Patience is the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. I don't naturally do that. I don't mind waiting for this long. Then fix it. Let's get this done. You see, what's the difference between with or without getting angry or upset? Focus. You ever go into a restaurant and it takes forever to get served? Or you order? And you realize they needed to go out and kill the animal and bring it from another state before they were going to serve you. I won't ask how you respond. I can tell you in my flesh how I respond. Do you know what changes me from being angry and upset to being compassionate? It's what I focus on. When I remember 
There is nothing that my server can do. They're not cooking the food. They don't like it any more than I do. They're just trying to earn their way through college. They're just trying to... So all of a sudden now, how am I going to treat this individual? And when I really stop and think about it, so I wonder, did this chef look out the door, see it was me, and decide I'm not going to cook his stuff? Or have other things happened? So that they send the wrong thing out, or they miscook it, and then they go, oh, we are so sorry. We'll go back and we'll fix it for you. 30 minutes later, the next one comes out. Wrong. And you have to remember what's important. Focus. You know what? Paul is reminding us, I don't know what you're going through right now. They tell us what they were going through in Thessalonica, and it was the persecution, it was the pressure that they were going through. And Paul said, I am so thankful for your patience. Patience keeps a right focus in the middle of delay. Patience is endurance. To prepare for a long run, you've got to practice running a long way. No one can do a marathon without working up to it. No one can go long distances without conditioning. Do you know God is developing in you what you need to accomplish your purpose here on earth? Well, I would love to have everything I need to accomplish God's will for me here on earth. I would just like it done now, right? You see, God never asks us to do what he does not equip us to do. Can I just repeat that to let that kind of settle in? God does not ask us to do what he does not equip us to do. But you, he has to allow you to condition to get ready for what's going to be maybe the, the biggest purpose for why you're here. Sometimes it takes some hurts, stretching, some pain. I did some things this past week that I haven't done in... 20 years and it wasn't so bad the next morning it was the second morning I got up this morning and I realized oh wow there are muscles there I didn't know I still had but you know what to be able to do what I was doing I'm going to have to work up I'm going to have to exercise to be able to do that better than what I did patience the second thing he mentions is faith Faith is acting on God's word. Faith is belief and confidence in an individual or an object. You sat down today without even questioning, well, probably most of you, without even questioning your chair. You had faith in the chair. You didn't even think about it. You already had processed in your mind, this chair is safe to sit on, I'm going to sit on this chair. You know... Faith is acting on what God says. But where does that confidence come from? It comes from learning that what God says is really the right thing. And often, the way the world talks, everything that God says is upside down. But in reality, it's the world that is upside down, and God's word is right. Faith is knowing a person so well that you can be confident in what they will do even under pressure. We also learn from Ephesians, faith is a shield of protection. Ephesians 6 tells us, take the shield of faith. Faith is the shield that protects believers against the fiery darts. Now, what are the fiery darts? The darts are doubts that God can do what he said, that God will provide what he promised, that God will never leave you. Think with me for a moment from Psalm 23. The psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. You notice there's this relationship that's taking place between the sheep and the shepherd. Places they've gone, things they've done. So he says, he restoreth my soul. He talks about, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And then he says, even, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. You see, faith is developed. It's a relationship. You don't just, I mean, you can, when you hear that God says, I can give you eternal life and you will never perish, that faith you have is based on what God has said, but it's when you understand what God has said, you begin to realize, you know what, he did this, he did this, he did this, he can do this. So faith, what takes away our fear? It's the confidence in who that is. If you said you wanted to build a home this morning and you came to me and you said, Pastor, I want to build a home, you obviously don't know me if you asked me to build your home. Now, if you went to Gary and you said, Gary, I want to build a home, well, that's a smart move. Why? Because I've seen his homes. I've been through his homes. I know what he does. Therefore, I have confidence if he says, you don't want to do that. In fact, recently, this past year, I had some questions about our home. I went to Gary and I said, I'd like to do this. And he goes, yeah, you could do that, but it's not up to code. It's not this. If you sell your home, you're going to have to tear it back out again. And my response was, I can't believe you'd say that. No, my response was, oh, man, that was really cool to find out. He just saved me all kind of money. Why? That's what he does. God, when you get to know him, you trade, you, by faith, you accept that he has provided salvation, and you know that because Jesus Christ came to this earth, died on the cross for you. He was buried. He rose again, and he said, I'm coming back for you. Well, you look at that, and you go, I can believe that, but then how do you live on a daily basis? Well, knowing God, and as you have spent time with him, and as you have been fed by him, and you have been comforted by him, green pastures, cool waters, as he has already restored your soul in certain circumstances, now when you come to the valley of unknowns, you don't have to fear. You see, faith was so important for them. And Paul, as he's talking about all this tribulation stuff they're going through, what does he focus on? He says, you've been patient. You're willing to wait. What were they waiting on? That's what we're going to be talking about. Maybe next week, maybe the week after, depending on how the Lord leads for next week's message. But I want you to notice the confidence that we have is that God is with us. Now, as we look at the last part, verses 5 through 10, and, and it won't take long because I want you to get this one big picture. As you read through that, you may struggle with understanding some of it, but I want you to see is this. Paul says... I'm grateful for what God has already done in your life. And then he focuses their eyes and says, remember who God is. God is righteous. That's not a term that we use a whole lot. Righteous in the middle of that is the word right. God always does right. He never does wrong. Now back up. They're in persecution. They're going through difficult times. What do they need to remember about God? And this is important for us to remember today, and that is God never tolerates sin. Now, he's patient. He's long-suffering. He waits for us to repent and to turn, but he doesn't make us repent and turn. Everyone's always free to choose. Your children are free to choose. You say, but I want them to make this decision. Yes, but you can't make them make that decision. We as parents do everything we can to remind our kids, ooh, that's not going to end well. You know, we, we watch things on YouTube. You get a bunch of guys together and what happens? Something bad. <laughs> Usually they'll go, oh, watch this. And what happens? That's going to leave a bad mark, right? Well, they shouldn't do it, but they're free to choose, aren't they? They just can't free, they're not free to choose the outcome. Every one of us is free to, re to receive or reject God. But we're not free to choose the outcome. Now, so Paul reminds them of this. And notice beginning at verse 5, he says, Now, your patience and your faith is a visible symbol, a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. When you see your trust in God, you know God is going to do right. God is holy which means he's always going to do right. 
God is also just. Now, a person will receive their just rewards. A person is judged based on what they do here on earth. Now, we're all sinners, and because we are sinners and God is holy, no sinner gets to heaven without that sin being paid for. But if you don't receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, hell is not the same for everyone because God is just. And they were beginning to realize this. He was reminding them, you can trust God. You see, the person that is the murderer, the person that is the whatever, um, they're going to be held accountable for it. Will Hitler be held accountable for the things he did? Absolutely. How about Stalin? Absolutely. How about the people who gassed all the Jews? Absolutely. How about the murderers? Absolutely. How about the swindlers who take your life savings and they leave you destitute? Absolutely. They're going to be held accountable for those things. You know, even if you choose not to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you'd be better to live a moral life. Because it could be worse in hell than what it's going to be. People talk about hell. You understand, our sins are awful and we will pay for those. Hell's going to be awful. I, I can't imagine making a choice between awful and awfuler. Is that a word? Anyway, whatever. You begin to realize he was challenging them to remember God's promises. No matter what your current circumstances, you have a secure and a glorious future is what he tells them. He says, it's a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Verse 6. And to those, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. Remember, when you're impatient, you lose your rest. I get that way, and I have to be reminded to bring my mind back. My God is just. My God is faithful. My God is long-suffering. And I'm glad he was. I'm glad he was for me. I grew up in a situation where I should have embraced Christianity immediately and I should have lived this righteous, holy life the rest of my life, and it didn't happen. And God was patient with me. Long-suffering. He didn't want me to perish. He reminds them, your future is secure, but those who reject God's gift of forgiveness of sins... He says, there is a time coming. Notice verse 6, seeing it as a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. You see, we're tempted to think that persecution, that trouble, means God doesn't care. But that's only because we don't understand. Your troubles are not because God is not a good God. Your troubles are because you live in a sinful world and you are a sinner. And sinners do bad things. And God in his patience is long-suffering to give you an opportunity to repent and come back. But for those of us who have already repented, we're still living in a world with people that haven't repented yet. And they're mean. And they're selfish. And they're self-centered. And so what does he tell them? He says... The way you respond in this trial process, what you're going through right now, is an opportunity for people to see what our God is really like. That we can have confidence in him. I don't have to make you pay. Because my God is righteous. He will right all wrongs. You see, it allows people to see God at work in us. There's a reward coming. One day Jesus is going to turn the tables and the wicked will suffer while the believers are rewarded. It's been a number of years ago. In fact, Zach would have been a very small guy at this point, so I don't even, he, he would remember. We were playing this game and I didn't really like the game because you would trade places with everyone else. So right when I was about to win, someone would trade places with me and now I was losing. 
you know, and it was like, so do you play the game to lose so that you can win at the end? Or how do you play this game? Because what it looked like, and it looked like you were doing really poorly, and then all of a sudden you realize you were winning. You see, our Lord never promised that life would here would be easy. What did he say? I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He promised, he said, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of bad things about you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be glad for great is your reward in heaven. Do you see how it's only when we look into the perfect mirror of God's word that we finally see the truth and so he's encouraging them. He's going to give them all the facts in chapter 2. He's going to explain the end times and stuff. But the end times really don't do much for you until you really focus on God. You see the goodness of God. What kind of future do unbelievers face? Notice in verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now we pause there because some would say, well, this is talking about annihilation, but it can't be annihilation if they are punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. It is the removal from the presence of the Lord, which is going to be the everlasting punishment because God is good. When you totally remove God from the circumstance, it is the extreme of evil. We enjoy God all around us. When you walk outside and you look at this incredibly beautiful day, see God. When someone does something kind to you, they let you in traffic, see God. Because selfish people don't do that. We, we have vestiges. We have these little snippets of God all around us. The beauty of the mountains, the beauty of flying and seeing the patchwork underneath you. All of that, we're seeing the creation, the beauty of God marred by sin. But God has not been removed from around us. But what kind of future do unbelievers face? Tribulation, vengeance, flaming fire, punishment. You see, they receive exactly what they deserve. God recompenses. God pays in kind. This is a, this is a, a startling revelation when you begin looking in Scripture. Pharaoh tried to, to drown all the male babies. What happened to his armies? They were drowned. Haman plotted to wipe out the Jews, and he was going to hang um, Mordecai from the gallows. What happened? All of Haman's sons were wiped out, and Haman was hung on the gallows that he intended. The king's advisors tried to have Daniel thrown into the lion's den. What happened to the king's advisors? They were all thrown into the lion's den. The Jewish leaders sacrificed Jesus in order to save their nation, and in a few years they saw the city destroyed and they saw their nation destroyed. We could go through many illustrations of the Old Testament. Not only does evil get punished, but evil gets repaid in kind. Wow. Makes you recognize, I want to do right. I want to do right because it honors God. But just from a practical standpoint, I don't want to do that to someone else. I don't want that. I don't want, you know, the old do unto others as you would have them do it to you, not do unto others before they can do it to you kind of thing. You begin to realize, you see, it's righteous for God to judge sin and to condemn sinners. A holy God can't leave sin unjudged. If you're sick... And you need surgery, which is more loving, to leave the disease or to take it out? Well, it's more loving to remove the disease. You see, vengeance is not the same as revenge. Vengeance satisfies God's holy law. Revenge satisfies a personal grudge. 
God doesn't hold a grudge against sinners. He sent his son to die for them. He pleads with them to return. So in verse 8, if they prefer not to know God and obey the gospel, there is nothing left but to receive the consequence, just to receive the result. You see, the details Paul's going to give us in chapter 2 are only encouraging when it's connected with the character of God. The end times make us curious, but the real hope is in the character of God. God does judge sin. We can relax and rest in the fact that God always does right. Someone has wronged you. Someone has done some things, and I can leave that up to God. Every person is judged for violating the law. So God's righteousness actually gives me confidence. Not because I'm perfect, but because God says, I'll provide a way for you. The Thessalonians demonstrated patience or endurance in the middle of persecution and tribulations. Persecution could be hostility, it could be ill treatment, and tribulations could be great trouble that you're going through or suffering. But they demonstrated patience. They enjoyed rest and they enjoyed faith, growing in confidence that God can supply. Isn't it interesting that Paul begins by saying, Grace and peace to you from God and from the Lord Jesus Christ. In the middle of people being difficult for us, in the middle of difficult circumstances, God in his wisdom is allowing you just enough training to allow you to become what you should be to allow the Thessalonians to prepare for running greater distances. So I would ask you today, are you feeling some hostility? Are you feeling ill treatment? Are you feeling like you can't handle what you're going through? Patience and faith. Sevilla Martin was born the year after the Civil War ended. We know she married a guy named John Geddes in 1891, but nothing ever more is said of that marriage or when it ended. I don't know if her husband died suddenly. We just don't know. We know that she then married an evangelist named Walter Martin. And she learned to trust God even when life didn't go the way she had wanted it to go. Here she married this man who was an evangelist. They were going to travel, and they traveled some, but her health fell apart, and she couldn't travel. Once she was so sick that Walter didn't even want to travel and be away for, from her. They had one little boy, and Walter was going to cancel the meeting. And their youngest son said, Father, don't you think that if God wants you to preach today, he will take care of mother while you're away? And these wonderful words encourage us. Don't you think that if God has this plan for your life, he can take care of you. Sevilla wrote a lot of poetry. This song that, well, this, this poem that her husband actually put to a tune, I think will encourage you. It's a familiar one. It goes like this. Be not dismayed, whatever be tied. God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide. God will take care of you. Do you want to sing the chorus with me? God will take care of you. Through every day or all the way, he will take care of you. God will take care of you. Her other verses said, Through days of toil when heart doth fail, God will take care of you. 
when dangers fierce your path assail, God will take care of you. All you may need, He will provide. God will take care of you. Nothing you ask will be denied. God will take care of you. No matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. Lean, weary one, upon his breast. God will take care of you. You picking up the theme here? And it recognizing God's character and remembering who God is. We talk about doctrine. That's the underpinnings that allows us to live the way that we should and to be the way we should as we remember who God is. Patience is accepting or tolerating delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. How can you live that way when you remember who's in charge? And you remember that that one in charge is good. Focus on purpose today. You're going through hard times. What's God's purpose? Maturity and preparation.